I love you, Cleveland. And I love you, Ohio. And a very pleasant welcome to this week's version of Bonus Time with Drennan here on the Big Play Sports Network. Great to have you aboard. I'm Bruce Drennan along with Ryan Smith. Got a lot to cover on today's show, the NCAA Tournament. Tanner Castora, NCAA college basketball expert, will be joining us in the second segment. Had him out a couple of weeks ago if you missed him. Don't want to miss this segment because he's very knowledgeable and uh, goes into every detail of this tournament, what has been played so far in these first two rounds, and what is forthcoming from the Sweet 16 on. Got the Cavs to cover. Baseball season upon us. The Guardians will be opening up in Oakland. The home opener with the Eclipse and all will be a week from Thursday. And Ryan, uh, good to have you aboard. How you doing? I'm doing well, Bruce. I'm, I'm excited for, obviously, the Guardians season opener down there in Oakland. Uh, 10 o'clock start, though. That's pretty late. It is. Well, it's West Coast, yeah. and uh, obviously we are starting on the West Coast. A lot of people, hey, there's always something to complain about. <laughs> if, if we were starting in Cleveland, if we were starting in Milwaukee, if we were starting somewhere in the north, the fans would be complaining, oh, can't they schedule West Coast or Southern cities? Well, you can't accommodate all of the 30 teams, you know, geographically because of the weather and the possibility here in late March, early April. But, um, yeah, um, it, we're taking on the Oakland A's, who nobody but nobody is expecting to make the playoffs, which doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to do well against them. But it certainly is better than opening up in New York against the Yankees or in Atlanta against the Braves. So look at it that way. Um, I want to uh, talk uh, in this first segment about the uh, the Cavaliers, but in the second segment, as I mentioned, we're going to have Tanner on, so uh, I want Ryan to give us two cents worth uh, so far about the NCAA basketball tournament. I'll reserve some of my opinions for that second segment, but Ryan, get it off your chest. What, uh, what struck you? Well, I got to say, obviously, the big upset was Kentucky. I, I, not that I'm a Kentucky fan by any mean, but John Calipari has had some recent real troubles in the NCAA tournament. And I guess that's what happens when you start a really young group. You know, he came out and said maybe that kind of bit him in the back a little bit. When you, you know, NCAA with the experience, Bruce, you talk about having experience in the playoffs, getting your foot wet all the time. Maybe that's what we saw with Kentucky. Yeah, I but let me, let me yeah. jump in. You know, he's known with the you know with the college rule in basketball that they can jump after one year he's known for getting all these incredible freshmen and doing a one shot deal the, the 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 season that he had the undefeated year until the the tournament um i think he made it to the semifinals before he got beat that year um those were all freshmen i mean so i, I don't know if that can be an excuse for him yeah, I know. I don't know if I've, yeah, I don't like excuses anyway, March Madness, whatever it is. But uh, I, I guess good for Purdue, getting the monkey off their back a little bit, advancing to the Sweet 16. They still got a lot to prove there. Uh, Illinois repping the Big Ten pretty well. They're still in it. Uh, Michigan State hung in there for a little bit with North Carolina, but they pulled away. Um, but the Pac-12, was Oregon was a bit of a surprise. But again, the Big East, UConn and Creighton, they're still in it. And again, my pick to win it all hey, was... Marquette. And Marquette, exactly. Um, my, my pick to win it all was Creighton. They're still in it. Maybe I got a little influenced by Tanner Castora, if you watched. <laughs> he was a big on Creighton, had him as a preseason sleeper. But I think we've had some amazing games. North Carolina State is obviously the, the uh, Cinderella, if you will, um, the, here in the Sweet 16. But um, I think for the first time in a while, Bruce, like in five years, all one and two seeds are in the Sweet 16. So as much as we talked about the parody of college basketball teams this year, uh, they really got the, uh, the rankings right here, the seeding, I should say. Yeah, and I don't know if I would venture to say, and I'll get into this when we welcome Tanner, but uh, I don't know if I would venture to say like we all kind of consensus believed going into the tournament that it was so wide open. Now I think, you know, it's been condensed somewhat. Uh, I could be wrong, but uh, we'll hear what he has to say. I mean, obviously Connecticut looks very strong. Purdue with Edie looks very strong. Um, it, we'll see about Houston. They they could have easily lost their last game to A and M. Um, Marquette's a good team, but Connecticut's had their number uh, this year. Um, Ryan mentioned Creighton. Uh, certainly, uh, they're formidable. I'll tell you, a team that's looking pretty good too is Arizona. But we'll get into all of that in the second segment in in much more detail. Uh, before we get to the Cavaliers, which I want to cover in this first segment, and by the way, in our third and final segment today, we'll be um, addressing the 
um, American League Central Division. That's the last of the six divisions that we will preview on Bonus Time with Drennan and obviously go into detail about our Cleveland Guardians as they open up Friday against Oakland and then the home opener with the Eclipse a week from Thursday. Um, I did uh, want to have um, a, a little bit of conversation about this new stadium for the Browns. And the way I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, Ryan, if they go to Brook Park, it will be a dome that will cost $2 billion. And if they renovate the current stadium, there'll be no dome, but it would only cost, I emphasize only, a billion dollars. Yes, that is correct, Bruce. Obviously, uh, a lot of people, the, everybody on Twitter is clamoring. The big thing that they want is the dome. It kind of seems the way the NFL is going. You know, we see these amazing stadiums, the Allegiant stadiums, the SoFi stadiums that have all these state-of-the-art facilities in there and the domes. But yeah, it, it, it's looking either Brook Park, a $2 billion bill, you get your dome, you get your brand new stadium, or here in Cleveland on the lakefront, you keep it there, a $1 billion renovation, which I'm completely fine with. And in my opinion, I'd rather have it stay there and just renovate it, me personally. But again, it's it's, it's a battle between, you know, uh, uh, the taxes. Obviously, the Haslams want the city to go half, which, you know, one and one, whatever the math works out to be. But uh, it, but it's still going to be, you know, a years and years, years long project. So I don't know if we're getting any news on it. Uh, coming up here. But again, the talks got revamped as the NFL's owner meeting was this last week. Um, I know Andrew Berry speak today. Obviously, the Haslam speak, spoke yesterday, uh, and the big topics were, yes, uh, talking about where the new stadium is going to be, what it's going to look like, if it's going to stay in Cleveland. And then the other uh, big part on that was he said in the near, very near future, he's got extensions for both Kevin Stefanski and Andrew Berry. Uh, he favors the Dome in Brook Park? You'd actually like a dome downtown, I'm sure. But. Yeah, that would definitely be the best case scenario. They said they they say you know they say it's equal one one and one. Who knows if they're holding their cards a little bit? I'm sure they do have an opinion, but uh, they said you know that they're open to both. Yeah, they um, they tore down that Ford plant out there, which that property is uh, massive, and of course you it wouldn't be good for the East Siders or Browns fans coming from. Um, certainly, it wouldn't it wouldn't affect uh, uh, Youngstown because you take the turnpike, but certainly Erie, PA, um, you have Browns fans from Erie, PA, and Conneaut, and those far eastern towns and communities in uh, north uh, northeastern Ohio. Um, it would affect them. But not not the west side. Uh, I don't even think the south side so much because you can come up uh, 77 or even get over to 71. You've got 480 right there. The turnpike isn't far away as well. But um, I, I, I do, you know, years ago before the, uh, when the Browns, when Modell left Cleveland and went to Baltimore and then, there was such an uproar and Congress and everything and uh, keep the colors, keep the name, bring the Browns back as an expansion team, which eventually they did uh, accomplish in 99. Um, part of it was this new stadium, which we are, have been playing in ever since. I was on WTAM radio at the time screaming, 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 screaming. build a dome. Build a dome. You can get the Super Bowl. No chance without it. Not in a city like this. Detroit has had the Super Bowl. Minnesota, I mean, no chance without a dome in a city up north like this. Uh, NCAA championship. Now, they have since obviously conducted um, national political conventions. Uh, the Republicans were here. Back in uh, what was it, twenty sixteen, um, and, and so you know you can conduct, and they did that at at uh, um, what is now Rocket Mortgage. So you can do that, but it would be more ideal to have it in a domed, a, a bigger capacity stadium, and all kinds of other events too. But particularly the NCAA basketball finals, which we're approaching. You have no chance unless you get a dome, I would think. You know, Indianapolis has hosted it. Would you agree with that, Ryan? Yeah, 100%. And, you know, that's a big reason that a lot of people are advocating for the dome. Obviously, the football reasons of, you know, you don't have to worry about the weather and all that, obviously. 
But then what it can bring. Obviously, people bring up things like, like you mentioned, the Final Fours. Like other, you could have concerts year-round. You know, it, it does bring a lot of benefits and can bring a lot of money. But then the flip side, you know, you move to Brook Park. That's not a totally developed area with a bunch of infrastructure. So kind of if you go do that dome, you're really going to have to, you know... Uh, upgrade for lack of better terms everything around brook park because you know by the airport there's not really much there and that's kind of what cleveland has going what for are you it, talking about hotels hotels restaurants bars just you know like in cleveland you can walk around and obviously do a lot i'm not sure, totally sure there's all that in brook park but obviously if they do go ahead and build that dome well, then that's going to be a part about I mean, it is it obligatory that they stay within blocks of the dome i don't think so i don't think it would hurt the downtown hotels at all um, from visiting teams um, uh, or, or just Browns fans that have to travel a distance. I don't think it would hurt those downtown hotels much. They could still do their partying the night before um, uh, in downtown. Um, so, I, and I don't know, uh, you're also not far from Crocker Park. True. You're closer to Crocker Park, which is developing. It's bigger and bigger and bigger every time I drive by there. So all of that to be considered. Um, I hope they go the Brook Park way and make it a dome. Let me ask you this in, in uh, finality. <laughs> As many of you know, I was born and raised in Chicago. When I was a kid, the Bears were talking about, they'd already moved from Wrigley Field to Soldier Field. And they were talking about moving to the suburbs, to a suburb called Arlington Heights, which is where the thoroughbred racetrack used to be. They've since torn that down. And the Bears were going to move out there. And uh, the late Richard J. Daly, the boss, if you do any historical research, the old mayor of Chicago... So well, that's fine. When he was asked in a press conference, uh, they can go to, they can go out there, they can call themselves the Arlington Bears, or the Heights Bears, or the Arlington Heights Bears, but they're not going to call themselves the Chicago Bears. That was the end of that. Has there been any of that discussion about? the name of the city, namely Cleveland. No, I, not that I've heard of. I'm sure there's the conspiracy people that are going on about it. There, let's, let's let's see. How does the Brook Park Brown sound? No, I can't imagine so. I mean, I would personally absolutely hate that. And I don't think it's such a historic city and a historic franchise. There's no way in the world you would ever change it from the could, Cleveland Browns. They could play hardball, though. Well, that's, the, the, and the, that's the, what the this Cleveland, whole game the, is. The Cleveland politicians could play hardball with yeah. Haslam that, and, and, and throw that at uh, 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 Haslam. And the organization, and, just and, like Daly did decades yeah, ago and I mean, in Chicago. Could be the start of what we're seeing. I mean, obviously, you know, the Haslam's said it's not a posturing move. They haven't purchased that land in Brook Park yet. Just brought it up that that's an option that they can do. So, of course, yeah, it, it, it's a giant game of hardball is what it is because obviously the Haslam's don't want to front all that money. And quite frankly, I don't think they should have to do 100% of it. So it, it's just a giant game of hardball. And I think we're really in the beginning phases of it. So this is going to be a topic of discussion for probably a years to come. All right, uh, let's shift over to the Cavaliers, who uh, before uh, a victory over Charlotte had had a rough go last Wednesday. They were defeated by Miami 107-104, then Friday Minnesota 104-91, then Sunday Miami 121-84, before a 115-92 victory over Charlotte. Second quarter, the Cavs outscored them 31-17 and then blew the game away in the fourth, outscoring them 37-26. to uh, Allen, 17 points, 13 rebounds. Garland with 15 points and 10 assists. And nice to see Mobley back, 17 points and 7 rebounds. Um, so obviously, uh, uh, no Struess, no Mitchell, but uh, getting Mobley back is a real key, Ryan. Yeah, and I mean, as much as you want to talk about, obviously, when you lose a superstar in Donovan Mitchell, of course your team's going to be worse off. However, I think it really, this stretch has exposed I don't know if Darius Garland can really be that guy. You know, we expected him when we gave him that contract to be our next point guard for the next five, at least five, hopefully five to eight years, right? He's kind of 
minimized himself in the stretch without a Donovan Mitchell. Not only him, but the whole Cavs offense. Outside of Jared Allen, everybody's been streaky at best, and that's credit to Jared Allen. He's earned himself into now, I think, untradeable territory for this Cavaliers team. Evan Mobley's back. That's really nice. He's going to have to keep playing well, obviously. But we're really not going to get Donovan Mitchell back. I think maybe just a couple of games, best case scenario, before the playoffs start. So we're going to be going into the playoffs, hopefully with a little continuity if Donovan Mitchell can get back before that, but that's not even a guarantee at that. And Darius Garland has been shaky, as I mentioned, at best. And a lot of people are down on Darius Garland. However, fortunately, we're on a smoother part of our schedule. We got Charlotte again, I think twice here. But then we have a little tough West Coast swing heading into the playoffs. But Bruce, they're hanging on there into the three seed. There's a realistic chance that they, by the playoffs, they could fall to that five seed. So well, I don't know. Well, you know, you anticipated my next question to you. A few weeks ago, if you recall, I asked you, especially when we learned the news about Mobley and Mitchell uh, being hurt and Garland had just returned, I said, uh, if you recall, Ryan, I said, are you concerned? And you said no. Um, but the Cavs have now fallen – from number two to the number three seed in the East. We're two and a half games behind Milwaukee. Uh, we're only a half a game ahead of the New York Knicks and only a game and a half ahead of Orlando with what, 10 games left? Something like that. And Bruce, the problem is, listen, Boston is by far the best team in the NBA, not just the East, the NBA. Outside of that, listen, yeah, Milwaukee's good, obviously, but you have the Milwaukee, Cavs, the Knicks. Uh, I mean, the Pacers are kind of in there, but the Magic have started to come up. That's wide open. So the thing is, for the Cavs, you want to draw a good first-round matchup there. You probably want to get the Magic, given that they're a young team. The Pacers, whose second half have definitely declined, they don't play defense at all. And you want to avoid having to play the Boston Celtics there in that second round if you want to make a real deep run. Because in the off chance you do meet Boston in the Eastern Conference Finals, at least then you had two rounds of teams throwing all they have at them. So I think it's really actually crucial that we stay there in the three seed, Bruce, if we want to make a run. Interesting. Well, we shall see. Uh, the Cavaliers will uh, be in action. Uh, we're taping the show this week on a Tuesday. Usually we tape on Wednesday, but they've got Charlotte, then uh, Philadelphia, Denver, heading into the month of April. As Ryan said, a West Coast swing with Utah, Phoenix, the L.A. Lakers, and the Clippers before concluding the regular season at home with Memphis, Indiana, and Charlotte again. So there you have it. Uh, again, uh, um, Tanner Castora coming up next. We will have um, Kevin Mackey with us next week when we're down to the final four. Kevin is the former head basketball coach at Cleveland State, led them to the NCAA tournament when he was here. And uh, for like 18, 19 years, he was a scout for the Indiana Pacers. Interesting story how he got hired by Larry Bird. And uh, so uh, those of you that have got a little tread on you, like yours truly, uh, you'll remember Kevin. But um, uh, those of you that are younger viewers of our show, uh, he's a fascinating guy with an outgoing personality, extremely great basketball knowledge. We'll preview the Final Four and talk some NBA with Kevin next week on the show. All right, coming up next, it'll be the NCAA breakdown as we get down to the Sweet 16 with Tanner Castora on Bonus Time with Drennan here on the Big Play Sports Network. Well, we're down to the Sweet 16, and great to have you with us. Bonus time with Drennan here on the Big Play Sports Network. Bruce Drennan along with Ryan Smith. This middle segment, we want to talk about the NCAA basketball tournament as we have whittled down to the Sweet 16. Tanner Castora is joining us again. He was with us a couple of weeks ago to preview the tournament before we completed rounds one and two. Tanner went to Strongsville High, Kent State University. He actually worked on my staff on my television show when I was with the network, former reporter and anchor for the CBS affiliate in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, currently writing a book uh, about the uh, San Diego State football coach, former coach John Steichelmeyer, and also uh, um, freelances on the Big Sioux Media Sports Network. Good to have you back, partner. How you doing? Doing fantastic. How are you doing, Bruce? Well, um, I'm doing great. I really enjoyed the first couple of rounds, and I want to break it all down. Um, I'm going to start with the number one ranked team in the country. Um, I, and, and I got to tell you, Tanner, um, 
I'm so impressed with Connecticut, with their chemistry, the way they play with one another. Um, we'll get to all the other teams, but it's hard to believe that they can't repeat as national champions. They're an example of what it looks like when you get talent to play together. You know, I'm watching ESPN and they're comparing them to, can they beat an NBA team? I think that's a little outlandish, but they do look that good. And a good example of the attitude of that team, they're up 52-19 to against Stetson at halftime. They're dominating. And a reporter interviews Dan Hurley, and Hurley's upset. And the reporter's asking him why. Well, because his team took, at least for one minute, their foot off the gas pedal. He is such an intense guy, and his players respond to him. All their starters were in double figures. They have no weaknesses. And UConn just seems to be built for March. They're a program who's won more national championships than anyone, I think, over a 25-year span. This is what they do. And I agree with you, Bruce. You've got to expect them to be the favorite to win it all. Now, the only thing I'd say is, look, they've looked fantastic, but they've done what they're supposed to do. They haven't played any great teams yet in this tournament, but they have certainly looked the part. Their offense has been fantastic, but even look at their defensive numbers. Stetson shot 31% against them. Northwestern shot 37% against them. That game was over by halftime. So UConn has certainly looked the part as the number one overall seed. Uh, the way they weave, the way they move the ball offensively, the way they look for the open shot, um, that reminds me of a Bobby Knight coach team when he was in his heyday at Indiana. They were so disciplined in, in being patient. Even when the shot clock came into existence in college ball, they were so patient to wait for just the shot that he wanted. This Connecticut team does that. And then they'll just come down the floor and they'll pop one from long range. I mean, they're, they're uncanny. Yeah, they can they can win in several different ways. And that is that is a good a good tool to have in the NCAA tournament. I heard a comparison and I thought this was cool, how each game is kind of like a different song, and you have to be able to dance to that particular song because every team has their own style they want to play. UConn can do it all. I mean, they can play down low. They can play in the half court. They can speed the game up playing the full court. They've got the athletes to do so. They can play however they want to, but really they're so good that you have to match them. And they're so physical and they're so disciplined. They do not beat themselves. They really don't turn the ball over at a high rate. You know, If you're going to beat UConn, you're going to have to shoot the lights out and they're going to have to have a bad game. And even with that, it's going to be a rock fight. All right, uh, before we get to their next opponent, San Diego State and the Sweet 16, I want to talk about Yale's upset of Auburn. What does that say for Bruce Pearl and, and his program, uh, considering the high expectations from the Auburn faithful coming into this tournament? I was one of them. I picked them to go pretty far in this tournament, and they got upset by a team who outplayed them. John Pulikidis, 28 points, knocking down three-point shots from distance. Auburn had their chances it felt like they had 10 chances 10 different shots in the last 30 seconds there to tie or take the lead and they didn't get it done that's one of the sec teams who i'm sure we'll talk about throughout this time who very disappointing stay in march they were supposed to make some noise auburn was supposedly going to be the team that could challenge uconn they certainly have the athletes to do it they lost they, they got beat yale outplayed them and then Yale got smacked in the next round. So that doesn't look well for Auburn either. But, you know, Bruce Pearl, in my eyes, is a pretty good coach. He recruits well. He had a great regular season. And they lost in March. And this has happened to them now a few times. So, you know, I don't think his seat's getting too hot yet. But, again, this is a pattern that if it continues – the alma mater is going to be unhappy, and, and you know they are right now. <laughs> San Diego State got any chance against UConn? This is what I'll say. If you're going to beat UConn, you've got to have something extra. What do I mean by that? This is it. San Diego State lost to UConn last year in the national championship. They're 10.5-point underdogs but they're going to be motivated coming into this game. And they've got a guy in Jadon Ladee who might be the best player in the tournament to this point. And I'd quickly like to highlight what he has done at San Diego State, okay? 
32 points, eight rebounds in round one against UAB. 26 points, nine boards, round two against Yale. Look at how he has progressed over his career. He's a fifth-year senior, started his career at Ohio State, spent his next two years at TCU, and now at San Diego State. Look at the numbers that he has averaged year by year. Year one, three points per game. Year two, 2.7. Year three, 5.8. Year four, 7.9. And now in year five, 21.5. That's a great example of someone in today's game, college basketball, who has stayed with it and has gotten better through progression. Instead of jumping to the G League or, or trying to play overseas, he's stayed in college basketball. He's gotten better. Now he's one of the best players in the tournament, playing like an All-American. He gives them a chance against UConn, and I think the chip on their shoulder from what happened last year helps them. I don't see an upset, but certainly not impossible. Well, the next um, possible opponent for UConn, if they get by San Diego State, is either Illinois or Iowa State. That's another Sweet 16 matchup. Illinois' route, of course, was a victory over Moorhead State, then DuCoin, where Iowa State was victorious over the school that you have covered and are presently yep. writing a book about, South Dakota State. And then, of course, the victory over Washington State. This figures to be an interesting matchup between Iowa State and Illinois. How do you see it? And, of course, if you want to talk about South Dakota State as well. Sure. I actually saw both of these teams play live because they played in Omaha where South Dakota State played. So I got to go cover the game. I was approved by the NCAA actually as an independent journalist, which was big for me. Very, very cool for me. My first time at the NCAA tournament. Very unique experience. A great crowd. And I saw both of these teams play in person. I'll start with Illinois. Now, I just mentioned a guy from San Diego State. Well, Terrence Shannon Jr. of Illinois he has a case as the best player in the tournament right now. His last six games, he has not scored under 25 points. It's eye-popping to watch that guy play live in person. He's 6'6", 225. He's so skilled, and he's so fast. I mean, that guy can get past anyone. And it's not just him for Illinois. Marcus Damask, his running mate, Damask had a triple-double against Moorhead State in round one, then followed that up with 22 points and seven rebounds against Duquesne. Well, how about Dane Danger? Great name, by the way. Talk about unstoppable. He literally hasn't been stopped. He's 6'9", 260. He's 13 of 13 from the floor so far in the tournament. Illinois has looked fantastic. And funny enough, their head coach, Brad Underwood, he's a well-known guy in the industry. It's actually his first time in the Sweet 16, so you know they'll be excited. But Iowa State, now that's who South Dakota State played in the round one game. I mean this. I have never seen defense like that in my life. It's unbelievable how hard they play. They speed you up like none other, and the numbers reflect that. Iowa State, they get off. They get 21 points off of turnovers per game. That's number one in the country, and you can see why. Watch how they trap ball screens every time, 40 minutes long. TJ Otzelberger, their head coach, does an incredible job getting those guys to play intensely. And you can't simulate that. Talking to the South Dakota State team after the game and the coaching staff, you can practice against it. You know it's coming. But it's another thing to see it in person. This has to be stylistically maybe the funnest matchup of the Sweet 16 for how good Illinois is playing on offense to how good Iowa State is on defense. This should be a great game. As we speak, Iowa State a two-point favorite. That's going to be a heck of a game. If I had to make a pick, I'll go with Iowa State to play UConn in the Elite Eight. But if you're going to watch a game this weekend, or really this week, watch Illinois and Iowa State play. Let's go to the West, where North Carolina, the number one seed, uh, as expected, uh, victory over Wagner. Uh, Izzo and the Spartans of Michigan State gave him a game for a while, but North Carolina prevailing comfortably before all was said and done. And their opponent will be Alabama from the Southeastern Conference. Obviously, Bama with a win over Charleston and then Grand Canyon, who upset St. Mary's. Alabama, North Carolina. How do you see this one? ACC versus the SEC. Four, nine of the 14 times that Carolina has made the final four, they've been a one seed. And they are again this year. Coasted past Wagner in the round one game. And then you mentioned it. That was a really intriguing game in round two against Michigan State. And I don't think the final score is indicative to how competitive that game was. The final score, 85-69. There was a point at the nine-minute mark 
where it felt like Michigan State had their chances. They had a couple turnovers, offensive rebounds they gave up, and North Carolina kind of pulled away. And if you heard Tom Izzo in his press conference afterwards, he was adamant saying, I will find a way to make a run in this tournament again. So he's motivated, it sounds like, after their loss against North Carolina. You know, it doesn't feel like a vintage UNC team to me, but if they keep winning, they will be that. And it's funny how you you, you want to compare fit and chemistry to talent. Elliot Cadeau, he's the freshman point guard for North Carolina. He fits so well with R.J. Davis, who's an All-American guard for North Carolina. Last year, they had Caleb Love, who now is an All-American at Arizona. He played together with R.J. Davis, and they didn't fit. They didn't even make the tournament. Now they replace him with a freshman who likes to pass the ball and get others involved, and North Carolina is playing really well. Now, Alabama, did you see that game against Grand Canyon? Holy smokes, it was frenetic, it was chaotic, and it felt like Grand Canyon had the better team, but Alabama had the best player. Mark Sears, who's an Ohio University transfer, was the best player in that game, and that's that's really how it goes in the tournament. For whatever reason, guards control things, especially late in game, because they can control tempo. They have the ball in their hands. He created for others, helped himself out, finished with 26 points, 12 assists, and six boards against Grand Canyon. Mark Sears versus R.J. Davis, two All-American guards in that game. That should be fun. Carolina, a three-point favorite. I like them to get it done and advance to the Elite Eight, beating Alabama. Clemson, Arizona figures to be a very interesting matchup. You talked about Arizona when we had you on a couple of weeks ago before we got the tournament underway. Obviously uh, impressive in uh, their route to the Sweet 16. But this is an interesting matchup, too, where you've got ACC versus the uh, defunct, um, disbanding Pac-12. Right. You know, you would... You heard so much talk coming into the tournament that this was a down year for the ACC. I said it myself. And don't look now, but they have four teams in the Sweet 16, more than any conference in this tournament. Clemson, look, they were, they're were they a six seed. They were an underdog against 11 seed New Mexico in round one. Vegas was way off. Tigers smacked the Lobos by 21, and then they upset Baylor again on Sunday night. Now let's look at Arizona. Really good program, but haven't been to the Final Four since 2001. 2001, with all those good teams they've had over the years, haven't been to the Final Four since then. Now, they look good in round one, and then against Dayton, looked like they were going to run away from the Flyers, and then suddenly it was a seven-point game at the half. Now, quickly want to mention Dayton. They had a great comeback against Nevada in round one. Trail by 17 with seven minutes to go. Dayton comes back, earns themselves a game against Arizona, and they were competitive. But Arizona, just too much firepower and really off the bench. They had 23 points off the bench. That's a very good tool to have in the tournament. At some point, you have to expect if you're going to make a run to the championship, you're going to get in foul trouble. You need help off the bench, and Arizona has that. They've got really everything you want. They're much more athletic than they were last season. Arizona is a a, – I wouldn't call them a sleeper, but they could win – it all. They're good enough to win it all. They have the talent. They're a seven and a half point favorite against Clemson. It is hard to trust them with their track record, but Arizona right now playing good basketball. Is there are they your choice to come out of the West in the for the final four? I did pick them to come out of the West into the final four where they'll play UConn. If that happens, that's a good matchup because UConn, they're so physical and they're so big. Not many teams can can match up with them just from a size standpoint. Arizona can. Now, Arizona has some work to do. They are a favorite against Clemson, and they'll have potentially a heck of a matchup against North Carolina. You talk about a cool storyline. Caleb Love, who is an All-American for Arizona, spent his first three years with North Carolina. He could play his old team, and, boy, that would be fun. <laughs> Caleb Love, you know, he, he kind of he, – he's a great player, but sometimes once in a while he'll have a game where he goes 6 of 21, kind of shoots his team out of a game. I think he'll be ready for that game against his old teammates. That would be a fun one if that comes to fruition. 
Let's go to the South, where, again, we have another number one. It's interesting we have ones and twos still alive in this tournament, but Houston is the one in the South. will play Duke, uh, obviously the Blue Devils, uh, victorious over Vermont, and then James Madison, who pulled off a sweet victory over uh, the number five seed, Wisconsin, from the Big Ten. I really wasn't shocked by that. James Madison's a good team, good program. Yeah. Um, Wisconsin was so up and down. They started the season so well, then went into a funk, got – the rack together a little bit at the end, but uh, um, I think the better team won. But here, Houston, what you know, A uh, and M should have beaten them. Uh, your comments. Well, I quickly wanted to say you mentioned all the one seeds you left. This is only the fifth time in history that all the one and two seeds have made the Sweet Sixteen. So you're right, that doesn't happen a lot. I do want to talk about Houston for a second. That had to be the the game of the tournament. That was an incredible ball game that Houston. You talk about surviving and advancing. That was the epitome of that term. But let's let's talk for a minute. Let's, let's focus on the Cougars. They allow, coming into this tournament, 57 points per game. That's the best in the NCAA. They gave up 95 against Texas A&M. Houston led that game by 11 points with a minute and 48 seconds left to play. And the Aggies slowly crept back into it. And then Anderson Garcia which would have been the shot of the tournament if, if Texas A&M would have won, hits a three as time expires. Great inbounds pass, by the way, by Tyrese Radford. Great inbounds pass. But they go into overtime, and I'm watching that game live going, is Houston going to be able to recover? They were shocked. You saw guys in disbelief as to what just happened, and they did. They found a way to win. Now, there's a couple alarming numbers from that win, Texas A&M had 23 offensive rebounds. Then you look at the free throws. Houston shot just 10. Texas A&M shot 45 free throws. <laughs> Houston's got to find a way to defend without falling. But Calvin Sampson, their head coach, what a job he has done with this program. And I want to quickly take a look at his journey. 16 years ago, he got in some major trouble recruiting violations at Indiana, and he was fired. He was given a five-year show ban, which means if any program was to hire him during that time, they would immediately go on probation. So there was real thought that Calvin Sampson would never coach again in the NCAA. He took an assistant job in the NBA with the Milwaukee Bucks, then the Houston Rockets. He was hired by Houston 10 years ago. Let's take a quick look at the progression. 2015, Houston, six games below 500. 16 and 17, they make the NIT. 2018, they lose in the second round of the NCAA tournament. 2019, they make the Sweet 16. 2020 was COVID. And 2021, they make the Final Four. Since then, they've kind of been a power in college basketball. Fifth straight year in the Sweet 16. They've got a great point guard in Jamal Shedd. He's an All-American. Also might be the best leader in college basketball. So Houston, look, they don't have great size, but they play together as a team and you said it. They should have lost against Texas A&M. They did not deserve to win that game with the way they played down the stretch. But they found a way to advance. And now they get Duke, who has quietly maybe looked like one of the best teams in the tournament as a four seed. Well, the Blue Devils will have their hands full with Houston's Cougars. There's no question about it. This is probably the best Houston team since they had Elvin Hayes going up against UCLA when John Wooden was still the coach there. Now, in that south upper bracket, you've got um, NC State and Marquette. Uh, Marquette, um, obviously, um, with their win over Western Kentucky and then Colorado, and they struggled against Colorado. That should concern Warriors yeah. fans. Oh, they're no longer the Warriors. I, but it, 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 I, I, the old school in me coming up. Uh, Tanner, the, <laughs> uh, the the thing that that got me Colorado upset Florida. They were up and down this year, but how about Oakland beating Calipari and Kentucky, uh, and then NC State prevailing as they should? But how about Oakland beating Kentucky? That was like that Yale victory over Auburn. We mentioned Calipari being on the hot seat potentially a couple weeks ago when we talked, and we kind of laughed about it. It's getting harder to defend him because of things like this happening. Kentucky hasn't been to the second week of the tournament since 2019. Now, look, let's give Oakland some credit here. Jack Golke hit 10 threes. That's unheard of. Teams don't make 10 threes in a game. He hit 10 threes as an individual. Greg Campy, he's been at Oakland as 40 years as the head coach. That's an incredible win for him. 
But, man, Kentucky probably has the most talented roster in college basketball. I mean, that's a legit argument to make. And they lost again in the first round. They didn't play good. And, look, Calipari's got to figure it out. And I think one thing that should be noted that bothers that fan base nearly as much as the upsets is the way he speaks in press conferences and interviews. If you listen to his press conference after their loss, he points out that it was the freshmen who were making mistakes. He sounds to me more like an analyst working for CBS at halftime than he does a coach. (laughs) You, You can't talk about your team like that, especially after you lose. It, it, it's just, he adds he adds gasoline on the fire that is already blazing. I don't think he's going to get fired. I think his thirty three million dollar buyout is in his favor. He does have a really good recruiting class coming in next year. He always this does. Can't happen again. Yeah, it, it, it can't happen again. And look, credit to Oakland. They they played well. They earned that victory. But as talented as Kentucky is, you can't lose in the first round when you've got a team like that. How's this matchup stack up to you? NC State and Marquette. Marquette should have gotten beat too. I know. Colorado, I actually picked them to go to the Sweet 16. I think Colorado's got a lot of talent. And Marquette, you know, they struggled to get by them. I'll talk about the Eagles in a second. Want to mention NC State first. You're a history guy. Does this not feel a bit like the 1983 NC State team? That team had to win the ACC tournament just to get to the big dance. Yeah. Well, NC State, they won five games in five days in the ACC tournament. Right. They sneak into the NCAA tournament. Well, now look, they take down Texas Tech in round one. Then they beat Oakland in overtime. And they've got a guy in DJ Burns, 6'9", 275, who's a low down low. He's a great passer out of the double team. And if this doesn't illustrate what March is about, Ben Middlebrooks had 21 points in their win over Texas Tech. He averages six points a game usually. Mohamed Diara, he had 17 points. He averages six points a game usually. They've got guys who are role players who are stepping up in the biggest moment. That's what the tournament's about. You've got to get production from other guys besides your stars. And NC State is doing so. Kevin Keats, he was on the hot seat, probably was going to get fired before the NCAA tournament. Now he's got his guys in the Sweet 16. Now, they've got a heck of a matchup in Marquette. And the big wonder for the Golden Eagles coming into this tournament was Tyler Kolick. He's their star point guard, but he missed the last six games of the regular season with an oblique injury. He comes back round one against Western Kentucky, and they had a little bit of trouble with the Hilltoppers. That was a game until about the 15-minute mark in the second half. Marquette pulled away. Kolick looked good, had 18 points, 11 assists in his return. And then they get Colorado. I thought the Buffaloes actually could win that game. And it went down to the stretch, a very good game. I know Colorado was a double-digit seed, but they're a good team. They might have two first-round picks on their roster. But again, guard play, the name of the game down the stretch. Tyler Kolick made things happen, finished with 21 points, 11 assists. Marquette's more than just Kolick. Cam Jones is a really good wing. David Joplin was a six-man of the year in the Big East. And Asu Agadoro is a 6'11 kid who's like a pogo stick down low. Great athlete. And Shaka Smart... Great passion as a coach. So, you know, it's kind of funny. You look at Marquette, you think of them as a basketball school, and they are. They hadn't been to the Sweet 16 since 2013. That makes all the more impressive what Gonzaga is doing, which I know we'll get to. Marquette back in the Sweet 16 for the first time since 2013. They're a a six-and-a-half-point favorite against NC State. I think they get it done and they advance to the Elite Eight. But NC State is as hot as anyone right now in the country. Let's go to the Midwest where, of course, the uh, player of the year again is featured with the Purdue Boilermakers, who were such an underachiever the last couple of years. But uh, maybe they're on a mission this year. Uh, Obviously, uh, it's so, so, so impressive against Utah State. uh, You get it down low to ED. He finds the open man for the three. They were shooting lights out. We can't possibly expect them to keep that kind of shooting up. But boy, oh boy, they're going to be a tough out. There's no question about it. And like I said, I think they're, they've got that added motivation because they've underachieved right. uh, uh, previously in the NCAA dance. Gonzaga, 
Um, all the great teams that Few has had over the years, and this is the least heralded of all of those teams, and here he is in the Sweet 16. And I got to tell you, Tanner, the game against Kansas, that first half was as great a basketball yes. as any fan could possibly want. I mean to tell you, those teams were back and forth, defense, shooting, passing, rebounding, everything was featured. It was fantastic. And then Gonzaga blows them away in the second half if you would have told someone what the final score was if, and they hadn't watched the first half they wouldn't have believed you i mean it was it was night and day with what happened in that ball game look gonzaga they are they're one of they might be a top five program actually they are a top five program in the entire country for a school with five thousand kids enrolled it's their 25th straight appearance in the ncaa tournament their ninth straight appearance in the sweet 16 that is incredible. That cannot be understated how impressive that is. No one else is doing what Gonzaga is doing. And to think about a month ago, they were on the bubble. Now they're a five seed, and they look unbelievable, and they're in the Sweet 16. You said it, Bruce. This is not supposed to be a, a vintage, great Gonzaga team, and you wouldn't know it. If, if you looked at the picks in round one, it was a popular upset pick to pick McNeese State to beat Gonzaga. And the Zags rolled them. And then they rolled the Jayhawks in the second half. Gonzaga went on a 32-4 to run against Kansas to, to absolutely coast away with that one. Look, you know, Mark Few knows what he's doing. Like, he, he should have the same reputation that Tom Izzo does of, let's not bet against this guy in March. Gonzaga is an institution of college basketball. They look really good, but they've got Purdue. And Purdue, outside of UConn, has probably looked like the most dominant team in this tournament. Now, Zach Eady, everyone knows about Eady. 30 points, 21 boards in round one, 23 points, 14 boards in round two against Utah. I, I really mean this. He might be the most effective player since maybe Ralph Sampson. With the way you have to game plan everything around him as an opponent, and then the foul trouble that he gets his opponents into changes the entire game. The open threes he gets his teammates changes the entire game. You mentioned how well they've shot and said, well, they can't continue to shoot like that. Maybe they can because of the looks they're getting. You've got to double Edie in the post. You have to. If you don't, he's going to score or get to the foul line. And that leaves people open. And he's a good, he's a good free throw shooter, too. Exactly. He, he, exactly. He gets to the line and he converts at the line. And they're so well constructed around him. They have shooters everywhere on the floor. They are playing as one unit. And a guy that should be mentioned that doesn't get the publicity he does because of Edie is Trey Kaufman Wren. He's a 6'9 post who would probably be the star of this team if it wasn't for Edie. He had 18 points and eight boards as well against Utah State. They've got every piece that they need to win it all. People have just doubted them because of their past history, which is fair. And I love Zach Eady in post-game interviews. He's short and he's to the point. We won. We're moving on. They're on a mission to get to the Final Four. And I think a part of that obviously has to do with what's happened the past couple of years. They're not playing around. A win is a win. On to the next one. Should be a fun game against Gonzaga. Two great coaches, two great programs. That's must-see TV. And Creighton and Tennessee to round things off, that final game in the Midwest. And, of course, Tennessee, another Southeastern Conference rep, a highly touted team, highly ranked all season long. But this Creighton team, you brought them to our attention a couple of weeks ago. And I watched them in their first game against Akron. And then uh, and I watched the Oregon game, too, against South Carolina. I was very impressed with Oregon. I couldn't believe they lost as many games as they did during the season after right. seeing their performance against South Carolina. So I figured, what a great matchup this is. And Creighton prevailed. They've got that inside-outside presence as well, Tanner. They're a real good team. They are. They're a threat to win it all. You look at Creighton. They have every piece that you need to make a run into the tournament, and it starts with Baylor Shireman. 18 points, 9 boards, 5 assists in that win against Oregon, and the game-tying shot to send it into the first overtime. He's clutch. And if you miss that game, you miss one of the best games as well in the tournament. Double overtime that game went into against Oregon. Quickly, though, I want to mention the static for, for Baylor Shireman. He is the only player in Division I history with at least 2,000 points, 
2,000 rebounds, 500 assists, and 300 three-pointers made. He's the only guy in Division I history, so know the name Baylor Shireman. But that game against Oregon was awesome. Double overtime. Jermaine Cousinard for Oregon had 32 points. The Folly Dante, a monster, 28 points, 20 boards. That was high-level basketball. And another example of surviving and advancing. You're probably going to have to do it at every point in the tournament if you want to get to a Final Four. And Creighton did that. And one thing, this is this is looking way ahead, but if you're going to beat Purdue, you've got to have a seven-footer. You've got to have someone who can at least give Edie a little bit of things to think about. And Creighton does. Ryan Kolkbrenner is seven foot. He was the defensive player of the year in the Big East, averages 17 points a game. He can play. So Creighton has the pieces to potentially match up with Purdue if that game happens. But they've got to play Tennessee first. Now, Tennessee is a two seed. One of the best teams in the country. They've got a top 10 pick in Dalton Connect, 6'6 six, six guard. He can go off for 30 at any point. But he did not look great against Texas in round two. It was 5 of 18 from the floor. And Tennessee did not look good as a team either. Look at some of their numbers. They were 3 of 25 from three-point land. They shot 12% from beyond the arc and 34% from the field. And they still beat Texas by four. Now that speaks to the Volunteers' defense. That's what Rick Barnes is known for. They play great defense, and now they have some guys who can score an offense as well. So they're a popular pick to get to the Final Four. But they did not look great, and I like Creighton. They were my preseason national champion pick. I mentioned it a couple weeks ago. Tennessee is a two-and-a-half-point favorite in this game, but I like the Creighton Blue Jays to advance to the Elite Eight. Uh, So it brings us down to your prediction for the Final Four, obviously Connecticut. Um, Am I correct in assuming you favor Arizona right now? To get to the Final Four? Yeah. Correct, yes. Okay, and then in the South, are you still Houston? Or are you looking at Marquette a little bit? You know, to tell you the truth, if I'm if I'm handicapping everything from what I've seen in the first two games, I'd take Duke. Now, I picked oh. Houston in my original bracket. But if I had to handicap what I saw off of the first two rounds, I think Duke is the favorite to get to a yeah, final. Four. Houston I don't really, like to say that. Houston really dodged the bullet in that game against a And M. And then uh, do you think Creighton can beat Purdue or you got to go with Purdue? I'm going to stick with Creighton because they're my pick, and I like what I see in them. <laughs> that's but... an interesting point you make about a seven-footer. I totally agree with that. If right. you Because that's the only chance that defensively you can play him one-on-one. Exactly. Because exactly. otherwise, if you double-team, he's going to find the open outside shooter, and like you say, open shot after open shot after open shot. Even if you have an off night, uh, they're still going to hit their share. Because they're going to get their looks, correct. I think Purdue's got to be the favorite, but Creighton has the pieces and the experience, and and this should be this should be factored in to that game if they play in the Elite Eight. Creighton lost last year in the Elite Eight. Okay, if you get back to that point, that's a motivating factor, and that stuff matters. They barely lost in the Elite Eight last year. If they can get back, they're going to want to take that next step to the Final Four, and they're a very old team Creighton has a lot of experience now so does Purdue that would be a great matchup again two great coaches I'll personally take Creighton but I think Purdue would be favored in that game by about four and a half points they look great but Creighton we'll see how they look against Tennessee if they can get by them if they can beat the Volunteers that's a heck of a wave of momentum into that Elite Eight matchup should be a very fun contest great stuff Tanner thanks so much buddy talk to you soon Yes, sir. Thank you, Bruce. Tanner Castora. All right, when we come back, I'll have our last divisional predictions. It's the American League Central. It's the Ask Bruce segment on Bonus Time with Drennan here on the Big Play Sports Network. All right, bonus time with Drennan continues here on the Big Play Sports Network. Good stuff with Tanner, huh, Brian? I, I, you I mean we were on during the break we talked about it. You said it perfectly. An encyclopedia. I mean, the, just to know the names of everybody and what caught my eye was just talking about the inbound pass in the Texas A and N game. He mentioned the guy who threw the inbound pass, and I mean credit to him. He mentioned his preseason pick was Creighton, and while Creighton was a good team headed into the season, obviously reflected in the rankings. I mean, they were by no favorite, a top five or top probably even top ten favorite, and Creighton's doing well. And again, I mentioned I picked it, Creighton to win it all. 
probably a little bit of credit to Tanner for motivating me and giving me some some background knowledge on him, but he's hit it spot on. And like he said, I am so excited, and I hope more than anything we get that Zach Eady Kalkbrenner matchup in Purdue and Creighton. That <laughs> should be good. Of course, the uh, Sweet 16 gets underway Thursday evening, Friday evening, Saturday and Sunday. Good Great uh, college basketball entertainment forthcoming. All right, time for us to uh, take a look at the last division of the six in the major leagues as we get the season going this week. The Guardians will open up Friday night against the Oakland Athletics. And so it brings us to the American League Central where the Guardians um, – uh, our, uh, that's one of that's their home, and uh, the division is considered, and I think justifiably, is the weakest division in all of baseball. With that being said, I think it's very doable for the Guardians to win it. We'll get to that in a minute. But um, let me start with the Chicago White Sox, who are still in a state of disarray. Uh, what are they doing on the south side of Chicago with aspirations on the north side with the Cubs, especially with Craig Council taking over as their manager? I mean, the fan base of the White Sox is very, very, very loyal over all these decades. But, boy, how do you create enthusiasm? Enthusiasm, considering uh, that they did absolutely nothing in the offseason. The 2023 campaign, they had a 10-game losing streak, season-altering injuries to Anderson and Moncada, and uh, Ken Williams and Rick Hahn, who had led the front office for more than two decades, um, who they were fired near the end of August for their roles in this Tremendous shipwreck, if you will. New general manager Chris Getz pledged to retain a Grafal, the manager. 61 and 101 was the record of the White Sox a year ago, with a payroll of 162 million and an attendance of 1.6 million, which is nothing to brag about in a city the size of Chicago. So, uh, with that being said, they've got their work cut out for them, no question about it. Dylan Cease is gone. They traded him away. Tim Anderson has fled. He's gone. Um, as far as what's left, and there's not much, that's for sure. Uh, Moncada will still be in that infield. He hit 260, uh, only 11 homers, 40 RBIs. Vaughn, uh, 21 homers, 80 RBIs. Ben Attende, I mean, you know, how many teams has he been on now? Five homers, 45 RBIs. They do have two good sluggers in Robert and Eloy Jimenez. Both of those guys can still put the bat on the ball. But uh, overall, uh, they are in for, uh, I think, another real long year. I can't see them making any advancements. Now, the next team I want to talk about are the Kansas City Royals, and they're getting a lot of hoopla around the country. They're saying this is the year that they're going to come about. A year ago, they were 56 and 106. To turn things around to a degree where you win a division and let alone compete in the postseason after a 56 106 season is hard for me to swallow. Um, Quantaro is their manager. Uh, their payroll is only 96 um, million. Their attendance, 1.3. Bobby Witt, of course, uh, is a super. Superstar. He established that status in the second half of the season. Uh, they found themselves a frontline uh, starter in Raggins, Cole Raggins, but easily leading the major leagues in stolen bases after the All Star break. And they've got contact heavy hitters uh, emerging. Uh, you might want to compare them to the Diamondbacks, if you will. I think the Guardians could be in that category too, as a singles and doubles hitting team. But the Royals matched a front uh, a franchise record 106 loss losses in the weakest division in all of baseball. This is the seventh straight losing season at a time when their owner, John Sherman, who was formerly a minority owner here in Cleveland under Paul Dolan, is trying to generate public support for a new downtown stadium, not helping their cause with a last place team. But the Royals signed veterans Michael Waka, the pitcher, Seth Lugo, Hunter Renfro, Will Smith, and Chris Stranton uh, to go along with some of the others. But uh, Raggins uh, um, is, is a fine looking young pitcher with a 7-5 and five record a year ago, 3.47 ERA. Salvador Perez, 23 homers, 80 RBIs, doesn't show any signs of aging, at least at the plate. And Bobby Witt's a beautiful ball player, no question about it. 276 average with 30 homers, 96 RBIs. He had 28 doubles, 11 triples, 
and 49 stolen bases. What a complete package indeed he is. But the Royals fired longtime front office leader Dayton Moore at the end of the 22 season, and they promoted his longtime right-hand man, J.J. Piccolo. But I just can't see the Royals competing after uh, losing well over 100 games a year ago. I think they're overrated, and it will show with the long course of the campaign. Now, next is the Detroit Tigers, and uh, this is a team that I think will be improved. Last year, they were 78 and 84, which is an improvement by itself. A.J. Hinch is a real good manager. They had a $121 million payroll last year, 1.6 million attendance. Tigers <coughs> might be on the verge. The 22 Tigers made a push to improve their roster, adding Javi Baez, Eduardo Rodriguez, Austin Meadows, Tucker Barnhart, but that team lost 96 games. So it certainly did not help that former Tigers infielder Isaac Paredes and Jamer Candelario were achieving strong seasons elsewhere after formerly being members of the Tigers. They have added Jack Flattery, the former Cardinal, to the rotation, and Kenta Maheda, the former twin to their rotation, but I just can't see the Tigers competing um, for the championship, even though they were vastly improved a year ago. They do have some uh, uh, fine young pitchers. Uh, uh, Tariq Skubal is a dandy. 7-3 um, record, 2.80 ERA, averages over 11 strikeouts per nine innings, and he's got talent. Big, tall lefty, really good stuff. Bias has got to have an improved season offensively after hitting only 222. Remember the numbers he put up with the Cubs? Oh, do I? Oh, my goodness. And and he's been such an underachiever since he put on that Tiger uniform. And Torkelson, I think the Tiger fans were expecting a lot more out of him. He only hit 233 a year ago. Badu has been injury-prone. Riley Green in that outfield. Uh, the Tigers, again, should be slightly improved, but I don't think well enough to win the division. Which brings us down to the Guardians and the Twins. The Twins are the consensus pick to win it, but quite frankly, I think our Guardians have got a good chance if we can stay relatively healthy, especially in the pitching staff, and so far we're not healthy in that pitching staff, but we scored the fourth fewest runs in the major leagues last season. We've got to improve on that. Under Terry Francona, who retired, we were 76 and 86, and of course, Stephen Vogt, the former catcher, very popular with the players, has taken over. Payroll, $91 million. Attendance, $1.8 million. And going into the season, we added Austin Hedges, Scott Barlow, who I think will be a good addition to the bullpen, especially with Stefan Hurt like he is, and Estefan Florial. He was formerly with the Yankees and very highly touted, so we'll see how he does. Around the horn, as you look at it, Kyle Manzardo was sent down to the minors with Dilo Santos after that move, being sent back to Arizona, he's only 20 years old. That caught me a little bit off guard, but that tells me that by May, middle of May, watch, Manzardo will be up for the Guardians. Jimenez still at second base, Golden Glove defender, needs to improve on the batting average. Jimenez a year ago hit 251, had 15 homers, 62 RBIs, did steal 30 bases, good ball player, 15 uh, home runs, and he had 27 doubles and five triples, but he's got to maintain offensively. Rocchio's going to start at shortstop rather than Arias, and obviously um, he's got a little better bat is why. Jose is obviously a, a superstar. I think the most underrated superstar in all of baseball. Stephen Kwan and left. Miles Straw waived by the Guardians. Cleared waivers because of that money. Uh, and indeed, he's been sent to the minors to start the season. He's still in the organization. Lariano, right now, strong arm defender. Bo Naylor behind the plate. His brother Josh will be at first base. And it, looking at the offense, uh, certainly um, it, it looks like Bo Naylor uh, at 237 to be tutored by Hedges defensively will help. But now we're looking for him to break out more as far as the offense is concerned. Um, Jimenez, I already mentioned. Josh Naylor's number is very good offensively. He'll have to continue to protect Jose Ramirez. Jose's off the charts good. But we need better uh, production from Will Brennan. You can't have just single and double hitters in your outfield. You've got to have some power. And with uh, Quan and Straw, 
saw, we didn't have it. Even Loriano doesn't provide that for us. Now, as far as the pitching is concerned, Gavin Williams is still out. He's not supposed to come back till April the 12th. Stefan, late July, if at all. And uh, Austin Hedges, the backup catcher, uh, looks like April 12th, so nothing too serious there. But the rotation I absolutely love. With Bieber, and I'm so glad that the Guardians did not depart with Bieber. Because if we're not in contention come, come trade deadline, trade them. You won't get as much, but so what? Trade them. But if we are in contention, you have to have that veteran presence in your rotation, and especially if you make the postseason. you got to have it. These are raw kids in the starting rotation, even as talented as they are. McKenzie's very injury-prone. He's got to stay healthy for us. That's a real key. Obviously, Bybee could have won Rookie of the Year a year ago. Gavin Williams, I mentioned, should be back by the middle of April. Power pitcher, got to love him. Logan Allen still has some work to do, but he's got a lot of finesse and I'm high on him, too. So we'll see how our team does. They're still a young ball club. We'll see how Vogt does. And as I've mentioned here on our show, I think it was vitally important to keep Carl Willis as the pitching coach to be right alongside Vogt, especially when we get to that portion of the game where you have to go to your pen. And Willis can be a tremendous consultant for the rookie manager, Vogt. Now, the Minnesota Twins. Uh, obviously, the defending champions, 87 and 75, their record. Rocco Baldelli um, is their manager. $156 million payroll, $1.9 million in attendance. Um, Carlos Correa had his career worst year at the plate. And Buxton, of course, is constantly um, stymied by injuries. Will this be the year that he stays healthy? Watch, because if he does, he's dangerous. Pablo Lopez, who they got in the Arise trade uh, from Miami, is a fabulous starting pitcher, uh, certainly front of the line. But they did lose Sonny Gray, and they did lose Kenta Maeda. So we'll see how that affects them. But indeed, they need more production out of Correa, who only hit 230. They still let Royce Lewis, who got hurt a year ago, is a tremendous talent at 309 batting average in only 217 at bats with 15 homers and 52 RBIs. So double those statistics, if you will. And obviously, uh, Kepler in left field. I mentioned Buxton. They're a formidable team. And uh, I'm, th I'm thankful we're in the weakest division in baseball because it's doable, it's winnable. And it'll depend on, I think, in our case, more run production, a little more power. I'm looking for that to be supplied by Florial once he gets his feet firmly set on the ground in the majors. And, of course, if we bring in uh, Manzardo. So we'll see, Ryan, but um, I'm trying to be optimistic. I think it's a winnable division. Yeah, you know, Bruce, the saying is, of course, obviously, it goes last but not least. But I think in this case, we saved the last for least, that being the AL Central. I think certainly the weakest division in baseball. And I think that really bodes well for the rookie manager and Steven Vogt. And I agree with you. There's no question that our rotation is solid, young, very promising. And like you said, I agree with you 100%. I love that we still have Bieber and he's going to be our opening day pitcher. You go look at them obviously sending... Uh, Miles Straw to AAA. And, you know, I think if anything, that's a sign that the Guardians know that they are just that close, that close being run production to being real competitors, not only in the AL Central, but in the MLB as a whole. Well, we saw Minnesota wasn't, uh, 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 once they got into the playoffs a year ago, they weren't expected to advance, and they did. There you go. They did. Then they were the very formidable in the playoffs. You know, I, I didn't mention Class A, who you can make a case as one of the top three, top five at worst uh, closers in all of Major League Baseball. I think a key getting Barlow will be a real key too. That's a nice offseason addition because he'll be a setup guy, whether he throws in the seventh or the eighth inning. He has had closer experience. But uh, Karen checks a guy I want to see healthy and adapt to the new pitch clock rule because we know he's got a fantastic curveball. He's got an overpowering fastball, which he's got to control, but I think he's his own worst enemy with all this mannerisms and flipping of the glove and the ball, and he's got to adapt to that pitch clock, and that's going to be a key as well. Yeah, and I can't tell you how excited I am for the likes of Tristan McKenzie if he can stay healthy, for the likes of Tanner Bybee, who had an amazing rookie campaign, and I expect his sophomore campaign to only be better, and you know, maybe we see that eventual passing of the torch. He might, Maybe he's the opening day starter next year. I mean, the future's so bright for him. We know he barely missed out on that rookie of the year to Gunnar Henderson, but if anything, you know, we talked about the White Sox and the Royals. I mean, as much as we want to talk about the Guardians not spending money or, you know, not getting over that hump ever since we went to the World Series, at least we're never in the basement, Bruce. 
What do we got in the Ask Bruce segment? Alrighty, we'll start with baseball here. Another one from our guy Andy he says, "Hey Bruce, given MLB's poor marketing of their product, <laughs> very so. What do you say to the young generation of kids to convince them to play and follow the game of baseball?" Oh, what a difficult question. I don't know if Major League Baseball can do much more than they do in pouring, pouring, pouring money into the inner city forming leagues for kids. But that's not the only problem. Kids in the suburbs aren't playing the game. They're all playing soccer. You go to all these suburban communities, they got tons of these soccer fields filled with kids because boys and girls can play together. And then the baseball diamonds right next to them are empty. It's a real problem in this country. You go down to Mexico or uh, Dominican Republic or Venezuela or Puerto Rico, no problem at all. St. Croix, the Caribbean countries. You go to Asia, no problem at all. It's incredibly popular. But here in the States, I don't. I wish I had the answer, Andy. I don't. I think that baseball, and you mentioned por a portion of it, marketing. Uh, and now with the Otani situation with his interpreter and that scandal, here he is the face of baseball now. Uh, but... And he's denying that he had any knowledge at all of what his interpreter was doing. I find that hard to believe. I mean, he's learned, uh, like, uh, I think he's learned from American politicians how to lie. Um, he's been in the country long enough to have learned. Because uh, how could he not know that his interpreter is with him everywhere he goes? Me and Matt have had this conversation on his show as well. Matt's under the same guise as you have. He finds it very hard to believe that Shohei did not know that that money was going missing. And... And Major League Baseball is in a dilemma. They don't want to dig up proof exactly. that he knew. Exactly. Because if they have to suspend him, exactly. where are they marketing-wise? Exactly. What a mess. <laughs> All righty, Bruce. If moving the Browns to Brook Park was the only way that they could get a dome, are you comfortable with them leaving Cleveland? Yes. Yes, because I think that dome is so important for the entire community. Absolutely Yes. Already, we'll stick into college basketball very timely outside of John Wooden, because I believe I know that. Do you think that is, of course, the greatest basketball coach of all time in the college ranks? What are the other names you think stand with John Wooden? Oh, Bobby Knight, without question. He won three national championships with Indiana in different eras, which is interesting. And his first one was the undefeated team, um, and that's the last uh, undefeated team to do it. But uh, it's ironic that they beat Michigan for the NCAA championship. That was when the Big Ten really legitimately was the best college basketball conference in the country. Um, I think you have to mention Calhoun of, Kentucky, of Connecticut. I think you have to mention him. Uh, I think Dean Smith at North Carolina is no noteworthy. I think you have to acknowledge what Roy Williams has accomplished. I think modern era uh, Bill Self, uh, because of what he did at Illinois, uh, setting up that team that went to the finals and lost in North Carolina and what he has done uh, at Kansas. So just to name a few off the top of my head, I, I think they all have to be categorized. You know, the, the interesting one that I didn't mention is Donovan. He won back-to-back -back championships at Florida, but then, of course, he went to the pros and underachieved. And isn't that funny in both football and in basketball? Great co coaches in college don't necessarily make great coaches yeah. in the pros. They come back to college, they achieve success again. What, a couple of exceptions. Jimmy Johnson was an exception. Uh, and um, uh, what's his name uh, from Southern Cal went to the Seattle Sea? Pete Carroll. Pete Carroll. There's another one that I think is an exception to the rule, but so many others have failed atrociously. Lou Holtz. Um, uh, Urban uh, Meyer. Uh, uh, Urban Meyer. Chip oh, Kelly. Oh, my God. <laughs> you know, yeah, there's a, a long list of those. All righty. Well, we're getting closer to the Masters here, Bruce. So uh, last question for golf. They want to know, Bruce, what's the most beautiful golf course you, you've played? And what's one golf course you've never played that you would really like to get the chance to? I think the most beautiful course would have to be Pebble Beach. Um, I'll never forget when I played it. It was 1981. I was doing the Indians play-by-play -play with Joe Tate, uh, and we were in Oakland, and we rented a car. Bert Grafe and I rented a car, and we shot down to Pebble, and I was one over par after six holes. Wow. I shot 97. <laughs> it reaches out and grabs you. I think that was the most beautiful course I've ever played. 
Uh, and what was the second part of the question? A course that you've never played, but you would love to get the opportunity Oh, to. I think that's Augusta National or any of those British Open courses. Bucket list, if you will. But you know what? You can't take a cart, I understand, on those British Open courses. You've got to... You got to walk, and that's rough walking oh. over there, especially with all the tread I've got on me these days. But boy, some, I'll tell you another beautiful course uh, that I played. It was 1986, uh, the mountain course at Kapalua. At the time, that was Hale Irwin's home course. And beautiful, because you're, you're elevated. It's mountain called the mountain course for a reason. And you're elevated seeing the entire island of Maui and the surrounding ocean. It's fantastic. Bre- breathtaking. Birthday. All righty. Well, that's it for us, Bruce. Good stuff, Ryan. And uh, next week, Kevin Mackey will join us to talk about the Final Four. And he was a scout for many years for the Indiana Pacers. We'll talk some NBA with Kevin, the former head basketball coach at Cleveland State University. And, of course, we will have the baseball season underway, so we look forward to that. We'll be able to talk all about Seat 16, the Elite Eight, whittling us down to the Final Four. So plenty on the agenda. And, of course, getting you ready for the Masters, the first of the big four in professional golf. I'm Bruce Drennan on behalf of Ryan Smith. Thanks for joining us. Bonus time with Drennan here on the Big Play Sports network have a great week we'll see you next week until then as always and most importantly you remember i love you ohio and 